while appearing on behalf of the applicants with the advisory opinion on the extent of state responsibility for climate change impacts and applicability of diplomatic immunity in the case of Republic of Moldova versus Republic of Hindustan and thirdly, responsibility of Hindustan towards climate change refugees in the case of Kingdom of Himalayan State versus the Republic of Hindustan. Your Excellencies, as per Para 55 of the MOOC proposition, the two specific issues before the Honorable uh, International Court of Justice at this point of time are with respect to the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice on the reference as made by the United Nations Security Council and secondly, the claim of diplomatic immunity in the matter between Republic of Moldova versus Republic of Hindustan. Your Excellencies, over the next 17 minutes of the court, the agent shall deal with the first issue, while as over the next 16 minutes of the court, my co-agent will assess the court in dealing with issue number two. If your Excellencies are members with the facts of the case, the council seeks permission to proceed with the arguments. Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, the first issue, that is the jurisdiction of the ICJ on the reference, as made by the United Nations Security Council, has broadly been divided into three parts. Firstly, that the advisory opinion can be given. And secondly, that the three matters can be clubbed. And thirdly, that the uh, Republic of Pakistan is liable for a lack of, for refusal to grant refugee status to the uh, refugees from KHS. Your Excellencies, if I may proceed to the first sub-issue, that is, advis advisory opinion can be given. This is further divided into two sub-issues, Your Excellencies. Firstly, that the United Nations Security Council is authorized to seek an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. And secondly, that there are no compelling reasons for the International Court of Justice to deny and rendering an advisory opinion. Your Excellencies, if I may uh, refer your attention uh, to page number 17 of the written submission, in the case of nuclear weapons advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice, on the question of whether it has jurisdiction to give an advisory opinion or not, it has divided this into three components. Specifically, the International Court of Justice looks at, firstly, whether the body is authorized to request an advisory opinion. Secondly, whether the issue at hand is in, within the competence of the requesting body. And thirdly, whether the question is a legal question. Your Excellencies, talking about the authorization of the United Nations Security Council, the bare text of Article 96 of the Charter of the United Nations and Article 65 of the stat uh, Statute of the International Court of Justice makes it abundantly clear that the United Nations Security Council may request the International Court of Justice to give an advisory opinion on any legal question. Your Excellencies, having established the authorization of the United Nations Security Council, I now move to the point that there are no compelling reasons for the Honorable Court of International Justice to deny and regret advisory opinion in this regard. Your Excellencies, before I do so, I would also like to uh, make a point here that, that seeking advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the extent of state responsibility for the impacts of climate change is well within the competence of the uh, Security Council. Your Excellencies, the question of climate change and its impacts on peace and security of the international community has been debated by the United Nations General Assembly itself and the Moot Proposition also says that in 2007 the United Nations Security Council also debated the consequences of the climate change on international peace and security. Your Excellencies, it is well established that your Excellencies, it is well established that the competence of the United Nations Security Council is primarily uh, the responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security. Having said that, Your Excellencies, this means that the climate change and the extent of state responsibility to offset climate change impacts comes within the purview of the competence of the United Nations Security Council and it is well within its competence to request an advisory opinion from this honorable bench. May I now move to the uh, next sub-issue which says that there are no compelling reasons for this court to decline and, uh, to decline rendering this advisory opinion. Your Excellency, the first, it is further divided into three sub-issues. Firstly, that the consent of the parties is irrelevant. And secondly, that it is a legal question. And thirdly, that there, are, there is potential usefulness in rendering this advisory opinion. Your Excellencies, on the point of consent of the parties being irrelevant, I would like to submit that the, that the jurisdiction of this court in contentious cases is always due to the consent of the parties under Article 36 of the uh, uh, Statute of the International Court of Justice, or otherwise it is through compulsory jurisdiction. 
Your Excellency is on the other hand, with respect to the advisory uh, jurisdiction, as was already stated by the agent, it comes under Article 96 of the Charter of the United Nations and Art Article 65 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. And Your Excellency, states are deemed to have given the consent at the time of signing the uh, signing the Charter of, Charter of the United Nations and the Statute of the International Court of Justice. In any case, Your Excellencies, even if it is not deemed to have been given at the time of signing, the consent is irrelevant as has been held by the uh, International Court of Justice in the advisory opinion on Western Sahara and also in the advisory opinion on the construction of a wall in the occupied territory of Palestine. Your Excellencies, having established that consent of the parties is irrelevant and the court can grant a advisory opinion, I now move to the point that it's a legal question. Your Excellencies, the question before this honorable court to render an advisory opinion is the extent of state responsibility to offset the human and social impacts of climate change. Your Excellencies, climate change is a much debated phenomenon and it cannot be denied that climate change has impacts on peace and security of the international community. Therefore, Your Excellencies, it is a legal question well backed by the international legal framework under the UNFCC and the uh, Tokyo Protocol and many other conventions and principles like no harm principle, precautionary principle and common but differentiated responsibility principle. Therefore, Your Excellencies, it is a legal question and the International Court of Justice can render an advisory opinion on this matter. Your Excellencies, if I may now move to the potential usefulness of rendering this advisory opinion. Your Excellencies, I submit that the, United, that the International Court of Justice usually looks at whether there would, would be potential usefulness in rendering an, rendering an advisory opinion as and when it is requested to do so. Though this is not the sole criteria to decide whether it should render an advisory opinion, but it takes into consideration the potential usefulness. Your Excellencies, at this point of time, the agent for the applicant submits that recourse to the International Court of Justice is a legitimate part of efforts to continue to build political support for stronger action on climate change. Your Excellencies, we are all aware of the plight of the low-lying islands. Your Excellencies, it is a question of their existence, mere existence and not enjoyment of any other rights. Your Excellencies, in, in the Barcelona Traction case, this Honorable Court has held that there is an inextricable link between environment and uh, your Excellency's uh, right to life. And there's, there's plenty of jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights and the African Court of Human Rights and many supranational courts which say that there's a clear link between a healthy environment and right to life. And wherever there's a degrading environment, right to life is violated. Your Excellencies, here the right to life, including many, many other social and political rights of the low-lying islands and their inhabitants are violated. And therefore, an advisory opinion by this honorable bench would be potentially useful to determine the state responsibility to offset the impact so that the plight of these people is addressed. Your Excellencies, having established that the International Court of Justice has jurisdiction to render an advisory opinion in this regard, the agent seeks permission to proceed to the next sub-issue. Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, the next sub-issue is that the matter, the matters can be clubbed. Your Excellencies, this is further divided into two parts. That the matters are similar and secondly, it would, lead to, it would not lead to singling out of the, uh, the Republic of Hindustan, which is the respondent in this case. Your Excellencies, before I do so, I would like to summarize what I said in the previous sub-issue. That is, the International Court of Justice has jurisdiction to render an advisory opinion because there is uh, potential usefulness, it is a legal question and the consent of states is irrelevant and that the United Nations Security Council is authorized to seek an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. Moving on to the, my issue on the, whether matters can be clubbed, the Council seeks permission to proceed to the issue that the matters are similar. Much of like your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, the power of the International Court of Justice to club matters is not given in the Statute of the International Court of Justice or the Charter of the United Nations. However, this power is given to the court under the rules of the International Court of Justice. Under Rule 47, as may be uh, seen on page number 28 of the written submissions, Your Excellencies, under Rule 40, Article 47 of the Rules of ICJ, the court may at any time direct that the proceedings in two or more uh, cases be joined. Your Excellencies, 
exercising this discretion, the court in this case has loved the matters because the matters are similar and the court the court takes into account whether there are similar legal instruments and whether there are similar parties to the uh, to the, to the uh, cases in question. Your Excellencies, it may be uh, brought to your notice at this point of time. On page number 29, in the cases of Federal Republic of Germany versus Denmark and Federal Republic of Germany versus Netherlands, and also the cases of Liberia and Ethiopia versus South Africa, as is given on page number 29, these cases were joined by the International Court of Justice when there were more than three parties, meaning that the number of parties is irrelevant and the court only looks whether the matters are similar or not before exercising its discretion under Article 47 of the Rules of the International Court of Justice. Your Excellencies, the contention of the respondents in this case is that rendering an advisory opinion and clubbing the matters of Republic of uh, Hindustan versus Republic of Moldova and also the Republic of Hindustan versus Repub uh, the Kingdom of Himalayan state would single them out when they allege that when the climate change cannot be attributable to one community, why should only the Kingdom of Indi the Republic of Hindustan be a party to this case? However, your excellencies, it is important to note that the advisory opinion as rendered by the International Court of Justice under Article 96 and Article 65 of the uh, Statute of the International Court of Justice are not binding on the parties. As such, there is no judicial determination of rights and liabilities of the respondents, that is the Republic of Hindustan in this case. Therefore, it will, will not prejudice any of their rights and as such, it would not lead to singling out of Hindustan. Much obliged, Your Excellencies, for the question. Your Excellencies, the power of the International Court of Justice to plug matters is given under Article 47 of the Rules of the ICJ. And the, the consideration that the court has to take into at the time of joining the cases is not given in there. However, the court has said that when the matters are similar, the, uh, the court can exercise this discretionary power to join the matters and the consent of the parties to join the matters is irrelevant. Also, the court takes into account whether it would cause prejudice to the party who is being joined to this and if there is no prejudice being caused to the party, the court has no hesitation in joining the matters. Thank you for your question, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, given these circumstances, it is submitted that the disputes between KHS and Hindustan can be clubbed with the matter on advisory opinion and the matter between Republic of Moldova and Republic of Hindustan. Your Excellencies, at this point of time, the agent now seeks permission to proceed to the liability issue. That is, the Republic of Hindustan is liable for violation of the rights of the refugees from Kingdom of Himalayan state and also for refusal to grant them refugee status. Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, if you may refer to page 32 of the written submissions. Generally understood, Your Excellencies, a refugee is a person forced to flee his home due to persecution, whether on an individual basis or a part of a mass exodus due to political, religious, military or other problems. Your Excellencies, this word, the phrase other problems is wide enough to include natural disasters as has been held by a number of courts all over the world. Your Excellencies, there, as already mentioned, in the case of uh, Barcelona attraction, the Honorable International Court of Justice has held that human rights are erga omnis obligations from which there can be no derogation. And that there is a clear link, inextricable link between the environment and the uh, right to life of the individuals. Your Excellencies, in this case, there was a devastating earthquake in 2014 in the Kingdom of Himalayan state, following which around 10,000 women and children were they fled from the Kingdom of Himalayan state into the Republic of Hindustan and Republic of Hindustan continuously and repeatedly refused to give protection to these people. Your Excellencies, we argue that this is a violation of the principles of international law and also of the customary international law. Your Excellencies, at this point of time, the agents for the applicants are well aware that the respondents that the Republic of Hindustan is not a signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention under which the refugees are defined. However, Your Excellencies, we are here saying that they have violated not only the Refugee Convention of 1951, but other conventions that they are a party to. 
Your Excellencies, they are a party to the United Nations Convention on Child Rights and are Article 3 of the same and are Article 3, Clause 4 of the South Convention on South Arrangement on the Child Welfare, Article 3, Clause 4. The best interests of the child are to be taken into consideration at every instance, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, the best interests of the child has has formed a part of the customary international law as can be seen on page number 34 of the written submission on behalf of the applicants. Your Excellencies, the Republic of uh, Indistan, in this case the respondents, they continuously and repeatedly refuse to grant any sort of protection when asked by the uh, Kingdom of Himalayan state to grant refugee status or any other protection to the vulnerable groups of children and women. However, they completely denied this and uh, therefore are liable. Your Excellencies. Just a minute, gentlemen. How do you define the determination of liability in this case? Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, uh, when the state has an international obligation, and if there is a violation of that obligation, the state is internationally liable to make do, make good of their losses. Your Excellencies, in this case, the Republic of Hindustan, that is the respondent, has violated many a rights given under the legal instruments to which they are a party, to which we are a party and as such they owed a general obligation to the international community to uphold the basic dignity of these victims who were whose rights were violated. Who has committed the mistake? Either of the party is to be determined. How did determine Much obliged your excellencies. Your excellencies the mistake or the obligation or the liability of the respondents is to be determined with respect to their obligations given by the legal instrument to which they are a part and also the corpus of the customary international law. Your Excellencies, if they have violated any of the rights, for example, I seek an extension of two minutes to complete my arguments, Your Excellencies. Much obliged, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, if they have violated any of the rights of the people who were in their territory, they are liable internationally in this regard. Thank you for your question, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, pursuant to Article 22, Clause 1 of the United Nations Convention on Child Rights, Republic of Hindustan has an obligation to ensure, as is given on page number 34 of the written submission, to ensure that a child who is seeking refugee status receives appropriate protection and humanitarian assistance. Your Excellencies, Hindustan has completely and completely refused to grant any sort of assistance or international protection, thereby violating the rights of the children and also of the women under the sea law. That is the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination, Convention on the Elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Your Excellencies, in any case, even if these people were illegal refugees, Your Excellencies, in the case of, if you may refer to a para number, uh, page number 35 of the written submission, in the case of Muska and others versus Belgium, the European Court of Human Rights has held that assuming but not considering they are illegal refugees, the extreme vulnerability of a child takes precedence over the status of an illegal refugee. Your Excellencies, in cases of mass influx, as was the case in the present case, one ten thousand women and children have fled from the devastating earthquake and come into the territory of the Republic of Hindustan. The person seeking asylum in cases of mass asylum influx should always receive at least temporary refuge and must be treated on the assumption of being refugees unless and until their status of refugees is determined. Your Excellencies, in this uh, in the present case, the Republic of Hindustan, as has been the government of the uh, applicants in this case, they have always and always repeatedly denied any kind of obligation under the international framework, thereby not even giving them the assumption or any protection, therefore violating their rights. Your Excellencies, it is also submitted that the Republic of Hindustan has violated, discriminated between the two sets of economies that is the Republic of Moldova and the Republic of Hindustan. Your Excellencies, they offered a voluntary, though it is a voluntary uh, scheme that they offer to the Republic of Moldova to adopt children from Republic of Moldova on a yearly basis. When the Republic of Hindustan requested the, requested the respondents in this case to afford the same protection to our children who were uh, who fled the kingdom of Himalayan state after a devastating earthquake? They refused to do so, do so, and were. Uh, and this is a clear violation of the South Convention on Regional Arrangements for the promotion of child welfare in South Asia, under which the uh, Republic of Hindustan is obligated to promote solidarity, cooperation, and collective action between and among South members 
member states in the arena of child rights and development. Your Excellencies, I would like to summarize my arguments at this point of time and say, firstly, that the International Court of Jurisdiction has, uh, International Court of Justice, I beg your pardon, has jurisdiction to render an advisory opinion because the United Nations Security Council is authorized. Secondly, it comes within the competence of the United Nations Security Council. And thirdly, there are no compelling reasons to deny rendering an advisory opinion. Secondly, Your Excellencies, I would like to say that the matters can be clubbed because the matters, as has been established, are similar. And secondly, rendering an advisory opinion and clubbing the matters would not lead to singling out of Hindustan. And thirdly, Your Excellencies, the Republic of Hindustan, the respondents in this case, are liable for the violation of the rights of the uh, refugees from the Kingdom of Himalayan State and also for refusal to grant them refugee status. With this, Your Excellencies, I now request my cohesion to assist the court with respect to issue number two. It was an honor uh, arguing before the bench. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Excellencies. I am the co-agent appearing on behalf of the applicants representing Mandova in this case where diplomatic immunity can be invoked even though the contention of the respondents is that it is a claim of change set of circumstances. Your Excellencies, in the, over the course of next 16 minutes, I would like to establish two fundamental, uh, two fundamental submissions on behalf of the applicants. Number one, by arresting the diplomat when he was on his way back to the airport, Hindustan has violated the principle of personal inviolability of the diplomatic agent. And number two, by subjecting him to the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state, in this case Hindustan, the uh, Republic of Hindustan has violated the principle of diplomatic immunity that is guaranteed under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961. Your Excellencies, my submissions are present in page number 37 and in page number 40 and thereof. Your Excellencies, I seek permission to move to the first issue. Uh, much of lecture, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, if you may please move to page number 37. It is submitted that by arresting the diplomat when he was on his way back to the airport, Hindustan has violated the principle of personal inviolability that is guaranteed under Article 39, under Article 29 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961. As per this principle, your Excellencies, which is mentioned in page number 37, the person of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable. He shall not be liable to any form of arrest or detention. And inviolability, which is the oldest established rule of diplomatic law, represents the fact that envoy shall be immune from any form of arrest or detention. Furthermore, Your Excellency, Article 30 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations states that the diplomat's papers, correspondence and his property shall enjoy uh, inviolability. And the, the word property has been interpreted to also include this motor car in this case, which was also stopped when he was on his way back to the airport. Your Excellency, in the Horses case of 1970, this very honourable court has held, if you may please move to page number 38 of the written submission, this very honourable court held that the inaction of the Iranian government faced with detection and imprisonment of US diplomatic and consular staff over an extended period constituted a clear and serious violation of Article 29 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Furthermore, this court, in the arrest warrant case of 2002, paragraph 54 of the judgment, held that issuance of an arrest warrant violated the inviolability of the foreign minister. And furthermore, Your Excellency, in the case of Congo versus Uganda of 2005, paragraph 338 of this judgment of this very honorable court, it was held that maltreatment by Congo forces within the Ugandan embassy of the Ugandan diplomats constituted a violation of Article 29 insofar as such persons were diplomats. The basic submission as of this moment is that personal inviolability is a recognized rule as per customary international law, treaties which is Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and has been reaffirmed by this very honorable court in a number of judgments. Your Excellencies, at this point, we do submit that there are certain exceptions to the principle of personal inviolability, which is, which is given in the page 39 of the written submission. The, this very honorable court in the hostages case held that in paragraph 86, that this, the observance of the principle of inviolability did not mean that a diplomatic agent caught in the act of committing an assault or other offence may not on occasion be briefly arrested by the police of the receiving state in order to prevent the commission of the particular crime. As per the facts of this case, given in paragraph 41, 42 and 43 of the compromise, it is submitted that the diplomat was on his way back to the airport 
and the exception laid down by this honorable court in the opt in this case do not apply because the for uh, for arrest of a diplomatic agent to be justified the diplomat has to be in the process of committing an offence or an act and in this case it is submitted that the diplomat was not in the process of committing an offence or an act and hence the doctrine of personal inviolability and its exceptions do not accord to the republic of hindustan and hence your excellency it is pleaded that the principle of personal inviolability has been violated by hindustan in their act of arresting the diplomat Your Excellency, as per page, uh, this state state practice also, Your Excellency, which follows the exceptions laid down by the hostages case, can be seen in page number 40 of the written submission, wherein in 1988 the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden was seen lying under a blanket in a sandpit and brandishing a fully loaded pistol. He was arrested. Your Excellency, it is submitted that again the offence he has to be in the process of committing an offence, and in this case it is not so, and hence. Just to sum up the argument, arrest is not justified, and personal inviolability has been violated. If you may please turn to page 40 of the written submission, it is the next submission of the applicants in this case that diplomatic immunity can be invoked in this case, and it has been violated. Your Excellency, firstly, it is submitted that diplomatic immunity is guaranteed under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961. As per this article, a diplomatic agent shall enjoy immunity from the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. Your Excellency, this very honourable court in the hostages case of 1980 laid emphasis on the importance of immunity from criminal jurisdiction by ruling that if the intention to submit the hostages. to any form of criminal trial or investigation were to be put into effect that would constitute a grave breach by iran of its obligations under article 31 paragraph 1 of the vienna convention on diplomatic relations furthermore in the arrest warrants case of 2002 paragraph 58 of the judgment stated that the court after carefully examining state practice including national legislation has been unable to find any practice that exists to show an exception to the principle of the uh, diplomatic immunity guaranteed under article 31 paragraph 1 of bcdr as of this moment it is a submission of the applicants that diplomatic immunity is absolute in nature and there are no exception accorded as such in the international framework to this principle of diplomatic immunity that is guaranteed under the vienna convention on diplomatic relations which is the reason why there have been no instances and state practice also indicates that a diplomat cannot be subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state Thank you very much for your question, Your Excellency. I was just getting to that point. Or uh, if you want me, I can answer the question, or I can answer it while I or when someone wants. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Your Excellency. It is submitted that the reconciliation of the citizens' rights and the principle of diplomatic immunity are in fact uh, hand in hand, and they are not stark concepts. It is our submission here that the principle of diplomatic immunity is merely a procedural bar in conducting of proceedings. It does not in any way mean that a diplomatic agent. Or the state which invokes the principle of diplomatic immunity entitles the diplomat to be liberated from the substantive liability of the law in which he has violated. Hence, Your Excellency, by invoking the principle of diplomatic immunity, it is submitted that it is only a procedural bar, and hence he cannot be subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. He can be subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the sending state, or there are plenty of other redresses available. Wherein the substantive liability still remains with the diplomat and is not liberated from the diplomat. Hence, it is only a procedural implication. At this point, it is a contention of the respondents that diplomatic immunity is a dwarfing principle, as mentioned in paragraph number 42 of the compromise. Wherein they have stated that diplomatic immunity is a dwarfing principle under international law due to change in our circumstances and scenarios. Your Excellency, it is submitted that this. Uh, this contention of the respondents in this talk cannot be accorded in this honourable court for the following reasons. If you please turn to page number 42 of the written submission, this very honourable court in the hostages case of 1980 described the Vienna Convention as a self-contained regime in paragraph 86 and paragraph 87 of its judgment. By this, the court seeks to enlighten the international community that there is plenty of redress available within the VCPR to counter the problems of abuse of diplomatic immunity, which is perhaps the most important and grave. Uh, 
precedent to set the uh, claim of change set of circumstances. And that precedent can also be tackled by the uh, by the VCDR itself, as has been described in the, in the by the International Court of Justice, calling it a self-contained regime. The redressals identified by the applicants are as follows. Number one, the most important redressal is declaring the diplomat who is abusing his power as a persona non grata under Article 9 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations as has been submitted in page number 42 of the memorial. By declaring someone persona non grata, it has been opined by many jurists such as Mr. Malcolm Shaw and Mr. Ian Brownlee that a receiving state declaring a diplomat to be persona non grata is perhaps the gravest uh, tackling method of tackling abuse of diplomatic immunity. State practice. Your, your Excellency, your, uh, thank you for your question, Your Excellency. It is submitted that uh, declaring someone persona non data is one of the many redressals available. If the international community or this court is of the opinion that declaring someone personal non grata is not a sufficient redressal, there are plenty of other redressals available which may be deemed fit to be some, uh, to be uh, um, prudent in the current set of circumstances. So, number one, in your excellency, if you may refer to the last lines of page number 42, in 2011, Russia declared Israel's military attaché to Moscow persona non grata as he was caught receiving secret information from a Russian citizen. In 2016, a Bangladeshi diplomat to Pakistan was declared persona non grata due to her abuse of diplomatic immunity. Hence, it is submitted that the principle of persona non grata under Article 9 is one of the redressive mechanisms to tackle the problem of abuse of diplomatic immunity. Another option available for the send or for the send is for the sending state to waive diplomatic immunity pursuant to Article 32 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Your Excellency, this is also uh, state practice also indicates this to be one of the redresses as Mr. Rizmail Khan, a diplomat in Wellington of Zimbabwe, was accused of offences and subsequently his immunity was waived. And New Zealand has waived immunity 13 out of 62 times it has occurred in the year 2014. This is one of the other redressal mechanisms available in case the international community or the states are of the opinion that declaring someone persona non grata as per your question, Mr. President, is not a prudent option. Another option available in extreme circumstances is for the states to severe diplomatic relations itself, as was done in April 1984. If you may please refer to page number 43 of the defense submission. And I quote, in April 1984, during a demonstration outside the Libyan People's Bureau, shots were fired from the windows of the Bureau, killing a young on-duty police constable. Subsequently, diplomatic immunity was granted, and to counter this abuse, diplomatic relations were severed. At this point, it is our submission that the severe diplomatic relations is, under, uh, is another way of tackling the abuse of diplomatic immunity, which accords the very fact that this court regarded diplomatic immunity and the rules of diplomatic law to be a self-contained regime, and hence this is another redressal mechanism available. At this point, it is extremely important to note, Your Excellencies, that the principle of diplomatic immunity is only a procedural part and it is in no way exempts the diplomat from the substantive liability of the law he has violated. Hence, Your Excellency, it is again reiterated that if a state or a diplomat invokes the principle of diplomatic immunity, it does not mean that they are above the laws of the land, it merely means that they cannot be tried in the jurisdiction of the receiving state. Furthermore, the government. Of the question is in the context of its own procedure. If 
chiedevo a libro se glielo tenevo, se non avevo così, il libro se glielo tenevo, però, ma ora ho pensato, ma sono già io ho pensato, in one state e non in the other. Therefore, I'll answer it, it can't be, the trial can't be conducted in the same state. Really long. Your Excellency, but with reference, Your Excellency, uh, the, I would like to ask that question in a two-fold manner. In this particular case, applying that question, a rape is also considered to be uh, the, a, a crime that is recognized by a lot of nations. And secondly, even so, if the offense is only an offense in one state, a bilateral agreement can also be signed to that effect, which accords the redressal mechanisms, which can be accorded and which can be uh, carried into effect to solve the dispute between the two particular states. Your Excellency, uh, one of the other redressal mechanisms is also the fact that the government of the receiving state may limit the diplomat in their country or not grant permission to increase the embassy bases in the receiving state. This was practiced by the United States by passing the United States Diplomatic Relations Act of 1978 wherein they decided that in case of extreme abuse, the permissions guaranteed to diplomats uh, to, to increase the embassy bases would be curtailed. And lastly, pursuant to Article 39 of the VCPR, if this is a private act, once the individual leaves his post, it is a uh, diplomatic immunity ceases to exist for the acts committed in his private nature. Your Excellency, furthermore, at this point, it is submitted that the calls for reform by Secretary General of the United Nations and other uh, jurists and in this time will, cannot be given due accordance for the following reasons. Your Excellency, number one, by not speaking for reform of the law related to diplomatic immunity, it is submitted that states have tacitly accepted the principles of diplomatic immunity and hence state practice indicates that the rules of diplomatic law as of today are justified and hence they have practiced it in that effect too. Hence, by reforming the law, it would be a clear violation of state practice. And number two, it would endanger the very purpose of bringing in the concept of diplomatic immunity as enshrined in the preamble of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Agreeably, some cases it would be possible to distinguish between a private and a public act. However, in extreme generalization, it would not be possible because there is still debate between jurists. Your Excellency, I seek an uh, uh, extension of two minutes to just finish my arguments. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, there is still a debate between jurists as to what constitutes a private act and what constitutes as a non-private act committed in those official functions. Hence, if we were to generalize this law and change it accordingly, it would amount to defeating the very purpose of according a diplomat diplomatic immunity as enshrined in, our, in the preamble of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, it is also submitted that uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular case, reform would not be uh, it would not be a viable option and there is plenty of redressal mechanisms, six as identified by the uh, agents for the applicant, which would help in countering the effect of the abuse of diplomatic immunity, which sets the base for change set of circumstances. To summarize your excellencies, it is submitted that a two-fold argument has been made in this, in this regard. Number one, by arresting the diplomat, the principle of personal inviolability under 29 has been violated and the exceptions don't apply to this case. And by subjecting him to the criminal jurisdiction of uh, the principle of diplomatic immunity under 31 paragraph 1 of the VCTR has been violated and diplomatic immunity is absolute in nature as indicated by state practice and number two, it does not exempt him from the substantive liability of the law involved and the agents from underwork are in no way justifying the acts or not justifying the acts. They are here to only argue the procedure behind diplomatic immunity and the procedure indicates that a diplomat enjoys absolute immunity from the criminal jurisdiction. Your Excellencies, if I may please move to my prayer. Thank you very much, uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, wherefore, in light of facts stated, authorities cited, arguments advanced, and governments made, the applicants for uh, the agents for the applicants most hum humbly and respectfully submit that the following reliefs be granted. That the ICG has jurisdiction to hear this particular advisory opinion and render an advisory opinion. That the matters can be clear. Number three, Hindustan has violated any of its international obligations. And number four, and the last relief which is sought to be declared is that diplomatic immunity can be invoked by the agents of Mandova in this particular case. On that note, uh, uh, it was an honor arguing before this. Thank you.